I'm Carrie Firestein, Chief Executive Officer of Allied Physicians Group, practicing pediatrician for over 30 years, mother of three, and grandmother of one. Congratulations to everyone who's here tonight, because if you're listening, it means that there is a little one um, in your life now or soon to be. It's a very exciting time. It's also a little bit scary because you wanna do all the right things, but you don't necessarily know what all the right things are. And there's so much information that comes to you from all different directions. Well, congratulations for being here tonight as well. You've taken the first step in learning all the things you need to know. And not only will you get lots of great information tonight, but you're getting a resource that you can turn to again and again. Allied Physicians Group, is a group of 150 pediatric practitioners. We have some others, but we are mostly pediatrics, um, including lactation medicine. And we run all over lower New York, and you're gonna meet some of the doctors here tonight. We are privately owned, which means that the doctors are the ones that direct what's, you know, what's going on at all times. And what you'll find is that you have doctors in the practice who not only have the resources of a much larger group, but have the individual interest in their communities. And Allied also has interest in our communities. We have Allied Foundation, which has our gala coming up um, in May, and you can check that out as well. So I'm gonna let our doctors introduce themselves. We're gonna start with um, our super doctor, Dr. Erica Schwartz-Cohen, um, who's gonna tell you where she's from and what she does. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Erica Schwartz-Cohen. I happen to be actually a family medicine physician. So what that means is that I take care of everyone from newborn, babies, toddlers, adolescents, as well as adults and senior citizens. So um, I can take care of your child from the beginning to every age. So you never have to leave this practice. In addition to that, I can also take care of you. So that's why it's so important I'm here today to talk a little bit about self-care. But I am a mother of three um, and uh, I love taking care. I love being to my um, office. I take care of my community in many different ways. So I'm a huge advocate for preventive care in our community. Welcome, Dr. Schwartz-Cohen. And we have Dr. Jamie Goldstein, who comes from one of our furthest practices, um, which is Monroe, New York. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Firestein. I'm Jamie Goldstein. I've been a practicing pediatrician for 18 years. I am very fortunate to practice in the practice that I grew up in. So I am serving the community I grew up in, um, which is unusual. And my partners have also grown up in the community. So we're uh, homegrown. Um, in addition to being a full-time pediatrician, I have two middle school age boys who I absolutely adore and I'm active part of their lives and active in the community. Um, and the kids get to see that I'm not just their physician. I get to be a mom. I get to... Uh, see them at dance classes and theater. And it's important that your kids see us out and about and know that we care about them all throughout their whole lives, not just when they're in our office. And then as far apart from Monroe, almost as you can get, is Dr. Nubia Vargas Chen, who is working in Allied's newest office in Rocky Point. Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Firestein. Uh, I'm Nubia Vargas Chen. I am a board certified pediatrician. And as Dr. Firestein mentioned, I am uh, the pediatrician at the Rocky Point location, which is a brand new state of the art uh, practice that we will be happy to have you as a patient. And uh, we will be happy to have you uh, even if you come from another practice to visit us. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful location. I'm really excited about how, how that happened. So Dr. Vargas Chen, we're gonna let you um, kick us off. Okay, so we are going to discuss uh, today about feeding. Uh, 
different uh, topics. And the first one that we are going to talk is about the hunger cues that the newborn will have. So we can differentiate this into three. The first one is the early ones that when the baby become more alert, more active, it start opening the mouth and smacking or licking the lips. And in some occasions, the babies even put the fingers in the mouth or the hand. So that will be the early signs. They can be active cues like rooting around the chest of whoever is carrying the baby or trying to position uh, to be nursed. So like grabbing the clothes of the person that is carrying them. Um, sometimes they, get, they can get fidgety and squirming a lot. Uh, or they start breathing fast. This is another of the active signs that they have. Uh, as a late sign, you the babies can be moving the head side to side, or the latest sign is to be crying. Uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that one of the most common questions is how much do we need to uh, feed the baby? So there is no magic numbers, but we will be uh, taking care of the baby basically uh, patient to patient or baby to baby. And uh, it de depends on the demand that the baby needs. So the, um, we are going to be feeding the baby every one to three hours. And this will be different for full-term babies or for preterm babies because the need of calories that they need, uh, we just need to be very consistent and we have to give at least eight to 10 feedings per day. And the sessions that we are going to feed these babies depends of number one, if the baby is irritable crying, if they are not going to be latching well. So uh, we need to keep in mind that the baby need to, relax, to be relaxed and to be at ease. And we can feed every hour and this will be the cluster feedings or we can go up to three hours, but no more than four hours because that will be a prolonged period of time and we will run into, into trouble. So if the baby is four hours, we need to stimulate the baby and make sure that the baby uh, will have some um, intake of the breastfeeding of the formula. How do we follow if the baby is getting enough? So obviously what is coming in need to come out. So we need to follow the amount of diapers. Uh, I tell my patients uh, to have a good number will be around eight diapers. So uh, I, my suggestion will be to put eight diapers in top of the counter, just in case that somebody else is taking care of the baby. So they will have eight diapers in the morning and they will count it to the day. Uh, it's important for the babies to be breastfed. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, give the recommendation to have breastfeeding um, up to the uh, year old. But why? Because that decreased the uh, hospitalization, that increased the immunity and the defenses that the babies will get to avoid infections. So uh, that's pretty much the, the most important thing that we need to keep in mind. Now, there are some occasions that uh, we need to uh, supplement with formula. There are different types of formula. Even if you go to the supermarket or you go to the baby store, you will have plenty of different cans, labels, brands. And, but the important thing is that you need to uh, follow the recommendations that your pediatrician gives uh, because it's different formulas for different type of uh, patients. So now when we have the, the breastfeeding, uh, so these type of uh, babies, uh, we need to make sure that they have a good output uh, the urine output that we are going to ask you every time that you guys go to see the doctor, we are going to ask you for the, 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 um, the, how many diapers and how the babies are feeding, uh, how the babies are um, sucking, because it's important to have a good latching 
And if we run into trouble with uh, the latching, we can get a lactation consultant. And in Ally, we have uh, Dr. Macaluso who covers uh, this type of consultations and she will be happy to assist uh, like our patients uh, in taking care of this. Now, when we have the breast uh, milk, we have the rules of four. So we can have the, the breast milk at room temperature up to four hours, and we can have it in the refrigerator up to four days. Uh, in the freezer will be six to 12 months, okay. And when we turn the breast milk, we can have it on the counter up to two hours. So it's very important to keep in mind what are the standards for a healthy uh, breast milk supply. Uh, when we set, talk about formula, we talk about a uh, variation of uh, like, like how much do we need to feed the baby? And it could be from one to two ounces every two to three hours. And you can, um, they said that up to two to four months, the baby is not going to need any um, feeding at night. Uh, the maximum that we feed the baby in, with formula will be up to 32 ounces be, um, per day. Uh, very important to keep in mind is how do we prepare the formula? So we need to follow the, the recommendations and the instructions that are in the, in the cans and to remember to keep the formula storage in cool places, but not in the refrigerator. Uh, in reference to the sleep, so it's very important to have a quantity and a quality of sleep. The quantity, the newborns, they sleep uh, between 16 to 17 hours, and but they sleep one to two hours at the time. They sleep eight to nine hours during the daytime and eight hours at night. This is obviously a variation that we have baby to baby. Uh, but it's very important to know that uh, the babies will have uh, the sleep cycle up to when the babies are about six months. So we need to, at the beginning, will be very rocky to have when we have the newborn and it's going to be um, a little hard for the parents, but it's going to get better. Uh, in reference to quality of uh, sleep, we have um, a quiet alert. So that's the baby that is awake and is staring. The, then we have the active alert. That is the baby that is uh, alert, but is moving around, interacting with the environment. And then we have the cry phase. We want to feed the baby during the active alert. And we want to let the baby, this is when the baby can uh, feed better. Uh, we, we don't want to feed the baby when the baby is crying because it's going to be more difficult. Uh, to improve the quality of the sleep, we are going to, we can use white noise, we can use dark room. Some people said that when we have, when we give the babies a nap, uh, when they take the nap, the, the lights need to be on and everything, but the sleep cycle and the sleep, um, the babies will sleep better in dark rooms. Um, so you will establish a routine for the baby in order that they can anticipate when is the, the nap time. Um, something that is very important that we stress, stress during the well checks is uh, the safe sleep. So 3,400 babies died suddenly uh, while sleeping last uh, year. And that's the reason that as a pediatrician, we stress the importance of the safe sleep. Babies need to sleep in a flat surface. As I mentioned to my patients, sleeping on the back, facing up, looking at the ceiling, no blankets, no pillows, no bracelets, no necklace. Uh, obviously in a smoke-free environment. And uh, the surface need to be firm so we don't put the babies to sleep on pillows because the babies, the neck can be bent and they can suffocate. We don't put anything in the crib because the babies can have uh, um, strangulation, suffocation or death. So that's um, our part for safe sleep. Now, 
the AAP, that is the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommend that the bassinet where the baby sleep during the first year of life it remains in the parents' room. Uh, Co-sleeping is not an option. Uh, this is something that I want, if something that I want you to keep in mind is co-sleeping is not, not good. So we need to put the babies to sleep on the cribs. We need to have the babies within an empty crib. And the other thing is that all these fancy mattresses, wedges, positioners, or breathing monitors, they have no scientific proof to, to decrease the SIDS, that is the Southern Infant Death Syndrome. So one of the th things that some parents use is the bedside beds, but the American Academy of Pediatrics is no for or against that because it's few studies and it's no conclusive. Um, the next one. The next, thank you. So swaddling, uh, we have in the website a very informative video that Dr. Firestein uh, did during the, for a fussy baby, uh, where she explains uh, swaddling. What is that? So swaddling is just to put the baby in a snuggly position where you uh, basically keep the baby uh, legs and arms uh, from avoiding flailing and it makes the baby safe and it helps the baby fall asleep. So you, if we are more than welcome to invite you to uh, check that video. Uh, she mentioned that we can, like we take basically a blanket and in a diamond shape, we fold the top, we lay the baby and then it's like the baseball uh, game. We go from third base to first base. Then we roll towards and tuck the baby. And we go from plate, home plate to second. And this is how we wrap. Obviously, like the picture that you guys have seen. Uh, we need to stop around two months. We don't use it again if the baby is rolling over because of the risk of suffocation. And it's very important that even you see that the baby is like all uh, snuggle, uh, the hips uh, need to have some room to move and we don't need to put the legs together because the anatomical um, and physiological or the normal way that the babies need to have are the hips open. So if we put the baby with the legs together and the hips together, like we are going to block and predispose for uh, issues with the hips that is, are called hip dysplasia. So that's it for me. Don't we have some of the cutest babies in our pictures? And when you see your baby, you're going to feel the same exact way. Um, so grooming, diapers. Um, there's all sorts of diapers on the market. They are way more absorbent than what you grew up wearing. And so we do tend to see more rashes and more um, adhesions where either the inner labia seal together or the sides of the penis adhere to the top after a circumcision. So whatever diaper you are most comfortable using for your child is fine. It can be cloth, it can be um, Huggies or Walmart brand or, or whatever you can afford. You do wanna make sure your baby's not sitting around in a wet or dirty diaper because that will cause skin breakdown. And I always recommend to my patients a good 15 to 30 minutes every day of airtime. No matter how quickly you change your baby, they're still sweating in there. It's still not the best environment for the skin. So to prevent adhesions, to prevent rashes, I tell all my parents in the newborn phase, you put them on a bunch of towels you don't care about and let them play naked. And then when they get a little older, they can sit in the bathtub without any water and some plastic toys and you sit there and supervise and that allows airtime into the private areas. Nails, baby nails grow incredibly fast. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of nail clippers. I've seen too many parents who the baby wiggled and then they accidentally cut their baby. Big fan of little baby nail files. Um, and babies don't have full control of their arm movements. So oftentimes you'll see scratches on your child's face 
because they've been moving around. They're not intentionally scratching themselves when they're newborns. So keep those nails short so that they cannot scratch their skin. Ears, don't clean them, leave them alone. <laughs> Ears clean themselves. The wax will move itself out. And then when it's kind of in the hole, you grab it with your finger, no Q-tips, please. You can actually impact the wax inside there. Or um, if you use a Q-tip too deep, you can actually puncture the eardrum and that'll affect your baby's hearing. The umbilical cord should fall off anywhere between about a week to three weeks after a baby is born. Uh, you don't really need to do anything about it. It's gonna be ooey and gooey and maybe ooze a little bit of yellow fluid or blood that's to be expected, um, pardon me. Once it's off, as long as the umbilical area is dry and you don't see any more discharge, then your baby can take an actual bath where they're submerged in water. Until that point though, we do sponge baths, um, cleaning under the neck, the armpits, in the groin area. Uh, if when the cord falls off, it's still oozing a little bit, that's something to go see your pediatrician about. They can take care of that for you and help continue the healing process. Circumcision, totally an independent parent decision. Um, should you choose to have your child circumcised, uh, the, typically it's the gynecologist that'll do it or the obstetrician. Um, sometimes moils will do it. Everyone has a different way of caring for it after. Some people will wrap the tip in gauze and, and tell parents, don't take it off until you get to the pediatrician. And that could be a week later. Um, some people just tell you to leave it alone and just put antibiotic cream on it and a gauze pad and into the diaper, which is my preferred method. Um, when you see a newly circumcised penis, it looks raw and painful, but the babies don't seem to mind it. Um, dad does, but the babies do fine. Um, you may see some yellow, thick, gooey substance on the head of the penis. That's healing tissue. Please leave it there. That's normal. It takes about a week for a penis to heal after a circumcision. Um, and then I always recommend to our parents until babies are potty trained, as long as they're in diapers, you want to put some sort of lubricant in the diaper so that the sides of the penis don't adhere to the top and glue themselves down. That, that happens a lot, again, because of these absorbent diapers. So to prevent that, I always tell my parents once the circumcision is healed, a little Vaseline a couple times a day, just put it in the front of the diaper and it'll help prevent those adhesions from happening. Baby skin, super fragile. Um, and it's been in a bathtub for 10 months. So when your baby comes out, they might be red and blotchy. You may see little red dots that kind of come and go. Um, their skin may be peeling a lot. That's all normal baby stuff. Um, usually around three to four weeks, we start seeing baby acne. So they actually get little pimples on their face, their upper neck, upper chest and back. Um, normal, goes away, nothing to do about it. You're not doing anything wrong. It's a okay. It's your baby's skin adjusting to the environment. I do recommend that um, depending on the water in the area you live in, there are certain products that are better than others. Up where I am in Orange County, we have really hard water. So I tend to stay away from products where the first ingredient is water. I like things that are more moisturizing. Um, Vino, Kerry, Eucerin, the organic products, CeraVe, Cetaphil, Dove, any of those are really good. Nothing scented, no scent should be on the baby's skin. Um, and you can certainly moisturize the baby because not in that first couple of weeks, but about a month or so you can start to moisturize because your baby's skin loses a lot of moisture between clothes and sheets and the air. Um, so it's important to keep their skin nice and moist. Next slide, please. Should I worry? No, that's why we're here. We're here to worry for you. Okay, um, totally okay to call your folks or your support team with questions, but things change all the time. And when I had my boys 11 and 13 years ago, the, the fever protocol was different than it is now. And allergy stuff was different than now. So always go to your pediatrician. There's always an allied pediatrician available to answer your questions and to talk you through whatever concerns you may have. Um, for the first six weeks of life, only take your baby's temperature if you think they feel warm. You do not need to be taking their temperature every couple of hours like they do in the hospital. The correct way to take a baby temperature is rectal till they're about six months old. And then you can do the ear thermometer if you'd like or continue the rectal thermometer. Up until a baby is six weeks, 
anything over 100.4, your pediatrician should know about, even if it's the middle of the night, okay? That, that, that first six weeks is concerning for fever. Um, don't give Tylenol unless you've checked with us, okay? We don't wanna mask things, um, but again, we're always available to you. Hiccups, totally normal. It's an immature nervous system. As the baby gets bigger and older, hiccups go away. So take video, cause it's funny. Sneezing, very normal. So is congestion. Um, babies, I find especially wintertime babies and C-section babies tend to sneeze a lot and are very congested. Uh, it's just the time of year that they're born. We can blow our noses. We can squirt saline up our noses. Babies can't do that. Sneezing is a way of clearing their passage, air passages. It doesn't mean that they have allergies. It doesn't mean that your baby is sick. It's a way to get the mucus out of the airway. And if you hear some congestion, take some saline for the nose, squirt it up there, and you can use one of the nasal aspiration devices. There's the little blue bulb syringe, which looks like a turkey baster. There's the battery operated vacuum thing, um, which plays music and, and vibrates and has two different size nasal heads that my boys loved. Um, and then there's the nose Frida where you stick one end in your child's nose and one end in your mouth and you suck. Uh, parents tell me it works beautifully. Um, it does have little valves in it. So the mucus doesn't wind up in your mouth. Um, so multiple different devices and it's saline is just salt water. So if they sound stuffy, especially before feeding or bed, feel free to use it. They may cough and choke a little bit because it goes back behind the nose into the throat, but they're going to be fine. Periodic breathing, totally normal. Um, babies will pant like dogs and then stop breathing for a couple seconds and it tends to freak you out but that's normal breathing in the first few weeks, so don't panic. Um, time to panic with breathing is if you see the skin above their collarbone, between their rib cage or under the rib cage, pulling in every time they breathe. If you're seeing that, then you need to call your pediatrician. Okay, that, that's concerning. Eyes crossing, totally normal. Again, baby's brain takes a long time to develop and get control of the body. In the first few weeks, baby's eyes will cross. They'll do all sorts of weird, wacky things. Um, even as a pediatrician, when my first one was born and he was happened to be in the NICU, I walked up to the neonatologist and said, I know I should know this, but he's not seizing because of his eyes. Right. And the, the doctor laughed at me, but it's all because they just don't have control yet. Okay. And they also can't see very far in the beginning. They see in black and white and they can only see a few inches that develops as, as they get older and two months comes and four months comes, they start getting much better distance vision much clearer vision and they can start to see color. Next slide, please. Visits and vaccines. There's a lot of them. Um, and as allied physicians and members of the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American College of Osteopathic Pediatricians, we are big believers in preventative medicine. And that's your assigned um, checkup visits, and getting vaccines on the schedule that um, the CDC and other entities have developed. Um, visits in the beginning are super frequent. You'll probably be seen a couple days after your baby is born and out of the hospital, then maybe at one to two weeks, a month, two months, four months, six months, then it, you change to every three months, then it's every six months until they're about three, and then it's once a year. But these import visits are so important to make do your best to get there. And if you can't, then call and reschedule. But it's our chance to check on you as parents and see how you're doing, uh, answer questions that you may have, alleviate some, in, alleviate some insecurities that you may have. We get to check your baby's growth, make sure that their head is growing properly, that they're growing lengthwise, they're gaining appropriate amounts of weight because every age has a different amount of weight that they should be gaining. Um, we can answer all your questions about sleep and feeding. We check developmental milestones, making sure that the baby's nervous system is developing appropriately, that their speech and their physical, their gross motor skills and their fine motor skills and their problem solving skills are all developing the way they should. And if you keep to your regular visits, if there's a problem, we should pick up on it and be able to get your baby help um, quickly, which makes all the difference in our final outcome of a grown mature adult. As for vaccines, there are a lot of them. And there's a lot more than when you were probably a kid. Thank you, Brianne. Um, it's overwhelming and it can be scary. Talk to us. We are here to answer your questions. 
We believe in the science and we would never ask you to do something we didn't do with our own children. And I remind my patients of that when they ask me about how many vaccines at a visit or the combination of vaccines at a visit. I would never put your child in harm's way if I didn't do it with my own. And I have in 18 years seen a lot of viruses that are vaccine preventable come back because up where I am, they don't always vaccinate. Um, I've seen viruses where in the beginning of my career, um, I would be up at the hospital every day with eight to 10 children in the hospital with something like rotavirus, which is a diarrhea virus. Um, and since the vaccine came out, if we admit one child a winter with that virus because of dehydration, that's a lot. Um, I've seen tetanus, or not tetanus, whooping cough, pertussis, which you used to get your last shot for pertussis when you were five. And in my 18 years now, they now give it at age 11 because we're finding that the teenagers are getting it and giving it to the elderly and the newborns again. And you should be getting that vaccine while you're pregnant and with every pregnancy. Um, so I've seen pertussis and then I've seen it go away again because of the vaccines. And then there's vaccines which are highly recommended, not necessarily mandatory. Um, I'm a big believer in those too. The varicella vaccine, which at least in New York state is mandatory for kindergarten. Um, I have parents who say, well, it's better to get chicken pox and, and have natural immunity. I can speak from personal experience that I almost lost my husband to varicella meningitis. He had chicken pox as a kid. And as an adult, instead of getting shingles, which is very painful, in my husband's case, it attacked his brain and I almost lost him. It, it's awful to know that there are vaccine preventable illnesses out there and people are still being resistant. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, I encourage you to talk to your pediatricians, go to where the science is. We are happy to have discussions with you and work with you so that you are comfortable, but so that your baby is protected. In addition to the vaccines, um, there are all sorts of screens that will be done at your visits. There's one to check on you and see how you as a parent are doing. Um, there's a maternal depression screen, but sometimes we have the dads show up or the grandparents show up and they're the primary caregiver and they're the one filling out that, que that questionnaire and that's okay. If you're the primary caregiver, we need to make sure that emotionally you're doing okay too. Um, there's developmental screens. You're gonna fill out a bunch of them to make sure the babies are hitting their milestones properly. Lead screening, depending on where you live in New York state or the country, there could be lead in your pipes or lead in your paint, especially if you live in an older home where there's construction or in uh, areas where they bring in pottery from other countries, there could be lead paint in the pottery or in the, the cans and things that you're shipping in from other countries. And lead can affect brain development. So we start looking for that around six months. Um, and then tuberculosis, because tuberculosis in children doesn't present like it does in adults. And there's lots of ways that your children can be exposed. Um, thankfully, we don't see it often anymore, but it's also because we're very diligent about screening for it. We do um, height, weight, and head circumference like we talked about. We talk about things like when to start fluoride and when to start vitamins and how to feed and when to feed and what do you feed. Um, what about peanuts? What about allergies? It, we've heard the wackiest and craziest questions and feel free to ask them. No question is dumb. Trust us. It's your baby. You need the answer. And I think that's it. So make sure you come to those visits, ask your questions about the vaccines and please get them. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. So how do we choose a pediatrician? That's a great, great question. The most important thing is when you're, when you're shopping around for your pediatrician um, is for me, when I started and I moved to my new community was to find someone that was convenient because in the first couple of years of life, like Dr. Goldstein said, we are going to be visiting that pediatrician many, many times during that first year. Um, you know, right after the hospital, a couple, you know, a couple of days after now that that babies are discharged 24 hours after a vaginal delivery, and sometimes two days after a C-section. So we want to see how that baby's doing right away. Um, so we convenience is number one, I would say, um, one of the first things on the list, because you really want to know that you can get quickly to that doctor 
to get all your questions answered when you're worried about your child. Um, number two, hours of operation. How many hours a day? What are the hours? Um, how many days of the week is the pediatrician open? What are um, the on-call schedule? Is there someone that you can speak to 24 hours a day? That was something so important to me as a, as a new mom or um, you know, moving to this community, knowing that I would have someone that I could reach out to, someone that would help me and give me that support that I needed right away. So knowing those times, those hours, knowing that, you're, that that pediatrician is gonna be there for you, even when they're not there in the office, that you're gonna be able to speak to, your, to one of the pediatricians in the office. Another thing that you might wanna know is, um, is there other people recommending, like a family member, a, a close friend? Is there somebody that highly recommends that their children have gone to that pediatrician and recommends them? Because remember, this pediatrician is the person that you're going to be building a long-term relationship. Pediatricians see your, your babies from the beginning of life, even sometimes beforehand, if you go and visit before while you're um, to talk about what to expect, like we're doing tonight, um, so we can get you prepared. But also as a baby, as a toddler, as a child, as an adolescent, which can be some of the trying years, you want to build that great relationship with that pediatrician because that pediatrician is the one that is going to be going over everything. They're going to be monitoring your child. They're going to be going over the developmental milestones that are so important, you know, dealing with education, whether or not they need help or they don't need help. Um, finding, you know, if there's any um, diagnosis, you know, if, if a child is sad and, and we go do tons of different um, developmental screening tools that we help figure these things out and to help you through these, these ages. And also like Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Vargas said, ask your pediatrician, you know, the questions, the concerns, making sure that they're there for you to answer all the questions you ha have, because we are the ones to worry for you. We don't want you to worry. We want you to relax so that you can enjoy this time with your newborn and your child and leave the, the worrying to us. We want to answer all your questions so that when you leave our office, that you don't stress. So that's the most important thing that you have that confidence that when you speak with that doctor, that that pediatrician, the one that you choose is the one that can give you that confidence to go home and you feel good and you feel confident. Another great important thing is insurance. So um, it's hard to go to the doctor. And um, I know that a lot of patients um, try to choose a pediatrician that's covered under insurance. I think it's a smart thing because number one, medical care can be very expensive. So um, choosing a pediatrician that's under your plan, sometimes the plan can also help recommend somebody in your area, which is also great. And you know, knowing their educational level, um, you can look them up on the American Academy of Pediatrics. You can look them up whether or not they're board certified and what kind of, if they, they have any specialties, like we have lactation specialists in our practice. We have different specialists that help out with different um, developmental um, issues through um, the years of life. So that's talking a little bit about how to choose a pediatrician. Um, remember, this is a really long-term relationship. You wanna choose wisely and you wanna be able to have that confidence in that pediatrician. You wanna feel be able to be very comfortable with that pediatrician and be able to ask any question. We can move on to the next slide, thank you. COVID-19 and newborns. So everyone asks, why should we vaccinate? Why is it so important to vaccinate, especially around newborns? So I have a lot of parents coming in asking, should I vaccinate during pregnancy? Should I have grandparents vaccinate? And the answer is absolutely. So COVID-19 has affected so many people's lives and our little newborn, our precious um, child that's coming into this world, we wanna protect them from everything. And obviously this new pandemic is something that we cannot control, but we can control I the people, but we can control the, um, the people that are around our newborn. So my biggest thing with newborns, and I tell my moms and, and dads and any caretaker, I really try to have no one around the baby that is not vaccinated, number one. Um, vaccinated for COVID-19, vaccinated for Tdap, which is our pertussis, our tetanus and diphtheria, and also for the flu, but also um, really important, 
the first two months of age, I really prefer that the baby isn't around anybody those first two months, but that the primary caretakers are vaccinated. So yes, do I recommend COVID-19 vaccine? Absolutely. And so anybody that's around that newborn should be vaccinated and um, because it will protect them. You know, they can't get vaccinated yet. You know, the CDC only recommends the age of five and above, um, but we wanna make sure that we would protect that baby. Get your vaccination, um, get your booster because it's reduced hospitalizations. It's reduced long COVID. It's reduced so many complications and we don't want your baby to get COVID. We don't know what all of the effects are. Of course, you know, newborns, babies, children do very well with COVID, but there are some cases of, of babies that, um, that have long-term effects with inflammation, and we don't want that to happen to your child. So please get vaccinated, have all your families and friends, if, once, if anybody's gonna be around your children and your newborn, to please get vaccinated. And again, try not to have anybody, even children around the baby, the first two months of age, because even a little virus with those little airways can be something detrimental to your to your beautiful newborn. So please just think about that. And everybody should always wear a mask if they're gonna be around the, the baby and washing hands really, really well. So that mask is so, so important. And everyone can say, yes, I have a cold or I have this. We don't know, you know, even COVID can be, have no symptoms. People are walking around with COVID that are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms and they can transmit it to your baby. So please, everyone should please wear a mask um, when they're around your newborn and wash their hands, not just hand sanitizer, but actually washing their hands um, for at least 20 seconds, please. So um, we wanna protect your baby, so please get your COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Self-care. Why is self-care so important? So self-care for yourself as a mom, as a parent, as a caretaker is one of the most important things. Why? If we are not feeling good ourselves, physically or mentally, we cannot take care of our children or our loved ones. And I am so, so, um, I, I push this all the time about preventive care and taking care of yourself and self-care. So number one, self-care, especially after having a newborn, you're tired, you're fatigued, so when that baby's sleeping, it's so important that you get your rest because when you're tired and you're feeling fatigued, you can't care for the baby and you feel exhausted and you know your, your stress levels will be up. So, so important. And that baby can feel that stress. So, so important that you have good self-care. So what does that mean? Taking that rest when you need it. Number two, um, making sure that you're psychologically feeling okay, that you're not sad. That you're, um, and that's why we have these um, screening tests. You know, within the first eight weeks, we might ask you to fill out a form. It's called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Why is that scale so important? It it really helps us detect postpartum depression. Postpartum depression is even at a higher rate post COVID. Why? Because we have been isolating ourselves for so long and now you have a newborn and now you're home for a lot of hours. You're tired, you're feeling, um, you're not, you may not be sad, but you're tired and you're fatigued and you haven't been around people for a long time. So staying social, and that doesn't mean that you have to be around a lot of people all the time. FaceTime your mom. We have such amazing technology. So stay in the loop with people by FaceTiming with your new baby. You can make phone calls to grandparents. Um, so staying, you know, socializing is so important for humans. So that socialization, making sure that you're connecting with people all the time. Don't lock yourself in the house for two months. I'm not saying because your baby can't, I don't want your baby around too many people for the first two months. I don't want you locking yourself up. I still want you socializing. You can FaceTime, you can do all sorts of different ways to socialize. So it doesn't have to be with direct contact all the time. Taking time for yourself, what does that mean? So if there is um, somebody that's helping you taking care of the baby, um, maybe going for a walk, going for a walk outside, exercising, eating healthy, feeling good, taking time for yourself, even if it's, and I tell moms all the time and dads, you know, go do something nice for yourself. I don't care if it's a foot massage or getting your nails done or something just to make yourself feel good. Go out, do um, a walk, a bike ride, something to get yourself out, get some fresh air. It's so important. And again, if you're feeling down and you're feeling 
us as pediatricians and family doctors are here for you, not just for your babies. We're here to take care of you too, so you can be the best mom and parent and dad and caretaker that you can be, and that that baby can be the best he, him, her, she, whatever she can be, so that we can make you feel good that you're raising this baby feeling the best in your best physical and mental shape. So, um, you know, we are here as um, pediatricians and family medicine doctors for not just self-care, not just to help you make decisions about your baby, but to help make decisions about yourself and your family, the whole family unit. So um, again, I want you guys to know that at, we are all here for you. There's always someone you can reach out to at Allied. Uh, um, to help guide you through these years of um, taking care of a newborn, a toddler, um, an adolescent, or even an adult child. You know, that's difficult too if they have um, developmental issues. So just so you know, we're here for any questions that you have. And again, um, I'm Dr. Erica Schwartz Cohen. So if anybody has any questions, we would love to, we would love to hear them. Okay, thank you guys. I always love listening to other pediatricians talk and hear their patter and their banter because over the years we get, you know, used to saying things in a certain way and in a way that parents can understand them. and I always learn something, you know, from everybody else. Um, one of the things I wanted, a few things I wanted to mention, one was telemedicine. When looking for a pediatrician, that's one of the things that um, you might want to look at. Initially, I thought that we wouldn't use it for newborns because newborns are so, um, you know, special and fragile and changing a lot. Uh, but I found that it's been great for newborns because it's a great way for parents to check in or look at their um, umbilical cord. Does this look right? Look at a circumcision. Is this the way they're breathing? You know, that kind of thing. And it's a great way to check in with your pediatrician without have, having to come out and, um, you know, put the baby in the car seat and do all those things that, you know, the first few times you do it seem to take you <laughs> an eternity of time. So Allied has telemedicine. Um, most of our offices do it during the day. We also have a nighttime telemedicine from 6.30 to 10.30, um, seven days a week. So you are able to get in touch with a pediatrician even in the evening hours, um, which you will appreciate. The other thing I didn't mention is our new parent helpline. So Allied started that sometime during the pandemic and Bree who you know introduced everything is gonna put that contact information into our chat and it'll go out in the email that goes to everybody. So, I mean, by all means, if you're an Allied um, family, you reach out first to your pediatrician, but if you haven't chosen an Allied office yet because the baby isn't born, or you have questions and you just kind of wanna check in um, with our helpline. We have somebody answering that and she sends it out to um, a select group of all the allied pediatricians and whoever gets a chance answers it. And we've found that it's been really helpful for some parents. Um, so there is that. Um, okay, I was going to actually ask some of these questions. Um, so Dr. Vargas did a great job um, showing how the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding. Um, but for those moms who do formula feed, um, Dr. Goldstein, do you recommend, um, you know, powder versus ready to feed or a certain bottle or nipple or anything like that? Because those moms have a lot of questions. Whatever works for you and your baby. A happy mom is a happy baby or a happy caretaker is a happy baby. Um, I had issues nursing myself, so I pumped and I didn't make enough for my boys. So they got some breast milk and some formula and they're absolutely fine. Um, while breast is best, you need to do what's best for you and your family and partner with your pediatrician. When it comes to formula, I'm a big fan of powder just because it travels easier and it doesn't go bad as quickly. Once you open the premix container, you have to use it within a certain number of days or it goes bad. Um, and powder certainly lighter weight, so it's easier to travel with, but kind of play with it. There, there's no difference in the nutrition of them. Um, 
So whatever works for you and your family is what you should be doing. The nice thing about powder too in the summer is you can keep it separate and just keep the water and then mix it when you need it on the spot. And um, it tends to be room temperature at that point because you haven't had to refrigerate anything when you're out. Um, so um, Dr. Vargas, the question um, in our chat is about breast milk versus formula being more satisfying. So there is a what I consider a myth that a formula-fed baby is more likely to sleep through the night than a breastfed baby. Um, can you comment on that? Um, okay, the, the breast milk is easily digested but uh, formula and breast milk, obviously the, the business of uh, making the formula is making the formula to be as similar as possible to the breast milk. So in all honesty, you can use either or, and sometimes even supplementing, but uh, babies that are breastfeeding babies, they some they eat, feed more often, so they can even feed every hour to two hours. Uh, the formula fed babies they go for a, a a little longer period of time, so there is no the, the myths of having uh, formula fed babies uh, sleep longer. I think it's just a myth. So, you know, as you point out, breastfeeding and, and you, Dr. Goldstein, can be complicated, right? We've been, um, we all have this picture of, you know, the mom sitting by the fireplace, breastfeeding, and, you know, how wonderful that bonding experience is. And many people do get there. Um, I do want to put a plug in for allied lactation because sometimes just that little tweak, a little change in positioning, early on can make a huge difference. So if you go to the Allied website, we do have um, the access, Dr. Macaluso, she's doing it all actually online right now. Um, in plain view, we have Dr. Edelstein. I don't know if she's on the, the website yet, um, but you can also make appointments with her. So if you have any questions and you go to the, the new um, parent hotline, you'll be able to, um, to get information on that. And um, the, the woman who answers that is lovely and she'll even be able to help you make an appointment. Um, so Dr. Schwartz Cohen, you know, you talked about how important it is for um, everybody to wear a mask around a baby. But what about your toddler um, who's going off to daycare or preschool and then coming home? Is it reasonable for them to wear a mask at home also? I, I, I'm so glad you asked that question. So, you know, a, a lot of um, babies do come in with little colds because of that toddler that's in, that is in the daycare. And um, they do come down with little viruses and little colds. And it's very difficult for a little toddler to wear a mask. You're right. They're not going to wear it. But what I, what I suggest to parents a lot of times is when that baby comes home, when that toddler comes home from daycare, I, I, I tell my parents, which have reduced a lot of infection in my household, when I had a newborn home and I had a toddler in daycare, um, was um, I take all no shoes in the house, number one. Number two, all the clothes would be taken off right after daycare. And I would do a quick bath for the baby, um, for the toddler. And I, that seemed to have reduced colds, viruses, and stomach viruses in my household, believe it or not. No, we can't have babies wear, um, toddlers wear masks around the babies, but I do also suggest that the toddler not to put his face or her face near the newborn. That, yeah, maybe we can touch the feet. I don't want the toddler near the baby's face at all. I, I highly suggest that in a newborn, you know, and try to keep them you know, not because I explained that they're going to bring home viruses and some of those viruses like RSV during the, the winter time or during the fall. And, you know, these babies can be, you know, affected with their breathing can be affected. So, you know, a lot of parents listen and, and um, they, the babies do very well. I agree with um, putting the toddler in charge of the baby's feet. I usually let the, you know, tell the parents, let them pick the socks, put the sock on, take the sock off, but try and keep them diaper, away, yeah. away from the face. Um, I will tell you that with my three kids, I was not nearly as fastidious as you when, you know, they came in, they washed their hands and, and that was about it. Um, and my third did 
have a little bronchiolitis at like seven weeks of age, <laughs> but <laughs> we made it through. So, exactly. um, so it's okay. Um, Dr. Vargas, we have a question about um, what to wear. Um, you know, her eight week old always seems hot and she's been told what I usually say, which is, you know, wear one layer more than the yeah, parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but if her toddler, if her uh, infant seems comfortable in a short sleeve shirt, like daddy does, is, is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Basically what I tell the parents is to wear an extra layer to make them wear an extra layer that we are, uh, wearing, but if the baby's comfortable, if the baby's happy, if the baby is active and interacting with the environment and the, and the baby is having the same amount of layers that you are wearing, there is no problem. But uh, my recommendation is always an extra layer, one extra layer. You don't want to overheat a baby because that will be a fuzzy baby and then they will develop heat rash. Right. So and when and when we talk about SIDS, it's actually more harmful to be too warm than it is to be too cold. Um, Dr. Goldstein, what temperature do you recommend the house be at? I recommend the room the baby's in between be between 68 and 72, not hot or not colder, especially in those few weeks, because babies can't really regulate their temperature so well. Um, and babies have brown fat behind their neck in the beginning, which is the same fat that allows you to a bear to hibernate. So they tend to feel very, very hot when you're touching their forehead. So if you think your baby's warm, maybe undress them a little bit, feel their belly, feel their legs, see what the temperature is. And then if you still think your baby's hot, take a temperature. And uh, one of the moms says that her baby always seems to be 99. Is that a problem? No, 98.6 is an average it's not a hard and fast rule. So some people run 97, 98, some people run in the 99s. As long as your baby's under 100.4, which is what the American Academy of Pediatrics regards as a fever, um, then you're fine. And how is your baby acting? That's always really important too. So if your baby is 99, but super fussy, you may wanna try and figure out why they're fussy. Um, so Dr. Schwartz Cohen, because uh, I know you're the exerciser among us, although everybody else may do it as well. Um, we have a question about um, going outside. So, you know, this mom knows that we need to limit interaction with other people, but what about solo hikes or just being outdoors? So um, I, I highly recommend that. So it's fine as long as number one, What's the temperature outside? Number two, uh, what's the weather like? Number three, how old is the baby? So um, in the beginning, the first couple of weeks, I would say, you know, just to get the baby um, acclimated to the environment that just coming home from the hospital, trying to get, you know, the feeding down and all that, I would recommend that at first. But then after that, I say, if the baby's in an enclosed um, uh, stroller, that's the baby's nice and secure and like a, you know, one of those car seats that can click in and they're nice and secure. And you can take a nice short walk around the block as long as you're not interacting with others. And of course, you know, everybody loves to come over to a baby. That's what you have to try to avoid. You don't want other people touching your baby. That's a newborn. So if you think that you're in a neighborhood where you're going to encounter a lot of people that are going to be coming over to your baby and touching your baby, I don't recommend that. But if you feel that you can walk around the block or come go outside and in your, in your little area. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with fresh air in a baby as long as there's no sun on the baby. We don't want any sun on the baby. Um, the baby's covered and that the temperature is, we don't want the baby getting too hot or too cold. You know, the temp, the, it has to be an ambient temperature for the baby. That's all. Right, this is actually a perfect time of year, right? Yes, absolutely. So what a great time to have a baby, not the winter. <laughs> You don't want to um, see sitting on the snow, but exercise is so important because not only that, it also gives you fresh air. So, you know, it's good to get outside, get a little bit of vitamin D from that natural sun for yourself. Now, I don't want the baby exposed to any sun right now, but, you know, it's always good to get some fresh air and be outside. Dr. Vargas, now that babies sleep on their backs, um, which is actually a 30 year old recommendation, by the way, um, how do you prevent a flat head? 
that's super important to to discuss too because we just want to uh, have tummy time during when the baby is awake and alert and supervised um, in order that we don't leave the baby for prolonged period of time on the back but no matter what the baby sleeps on the back and plays on the belly so need to be supervised this is something that uh, I stress all my parents, they need to have tummy time uh, because of the stretching of the muscles, because it's good for the core of the baby, but they need to sleep on the back. Yeah. And you know what, there are some things that parents can't control. And if your baby's head is gonna get a little flat, you know, hopefully they'll get better as they sit up more, but you have to really learn that um, you're not in control of everything that goes on. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Um, but yes, you can put them on the back and put them on the belly and, and do all the right things and, and still they might have a flat head. And that's a great conversation to have with your pediatrician. Um, I had another question here um, about Similac, Dr. Goldstein. So since the Similac recall, um, is it safe at this point to use Similac? And um, is it just better to, to use something else? And while you're talking about that, can you talk about this trend to use these formulas coming from Europe? For some reason, Bobby and Hippie and whatever are, are considered um, the new, um, you know, the new in thing. Do you have thoughts on that? Absolutely. So number one, the Similac recall was proactive on their part. There were only two known cases of the bacteria that they thought may have come from the powdered formula. So the Similac itself did the responsible thing and pulled the, the products off the, the shelves. Um, but it was the powder, not the premix. So if you had the premix formula, you're still good. Um, while we're waiting for the formula to get ramped up in production, um, bacteria free, and while we're waiting for it to get shipped places, you can certainly use other brands. Um, Enfamil is another very well-known brand, very reputable. Um, there's organic brands, there's uh, Gerber, also excellent, well-known brands, uh, and they all have similar product line. So they'll have the low, the low lactose and the high, partially hydrolyzed, uh, hydrolyzed, that's a tough word, um, and the amino acid-based formulas for those of you who have babies that have more particular needs. Um, and we can even adjust powdered formula to be more concentrated for the preemies that may need more calories. These are just ask your pediatrician. Um, and oftentimes we have samples in our office for you to try so that you can sample it with your baby and make sure they adjust to it well before you go spending the $35 to $45 on a can of formula. Okay. Um, as for the stuff from overseas, it is not FDA approved, so no one's really watching the production lines. They also tend to not have as many nutrients as formulas that are made here in the United States. Um, they tend not to have enough iron, um, and we need iron for anemia, for brain development. It's not something that you don't want to have in a formula. Um, goat's milk formula, a lot of people are making their own that also can have some nutritional def deficiencies. So even though I've seen recipes online, you're still really better off using a cow's milk based formula um, or something from one of those companies that is tried and true and has been around since you were a kid. Uh, and always, always, always follow the directions on how to mix it if you're using the powder um, because we've had babies whose parents couldn't afford or thought that they were doing the baby better by thinning it out. And then the child's not getting the right amount of calories and their brain um, suffers and their development suffers. So talk to your pediatrician, always. On that same note, there's a product called the Baby Breeza, which is kind of like a Keurig machine for formula. You put the powder in and it makes it for you. And while I know some parents love it, there have been babies admitted to the hospital with either too much water in their system or too little water in their system because you know, they're eating seven, eight times a day. If that baby Brisa is off even a little bit, it could end up causing a problem. So um, I recommend just doing it the old fashioned way and actually measuring it yourself. Uh, okay, last 
question. My eight week old son is solely eating formula. He seems to constantly be pushing and grunting. Um, is that okay and safe? We are considering changing formulas. You wanna pick that one up, Dr. schwartz Cullen? Absolutely. So um, we get that quite often sometimes with babies that are a little fussy, that are a little colicky. Um, and uh, so the first thing that we have parents do is we ask about um, which formula they're on, number one. Number two, um, or breastfeeding, depends whether they're breastfeeding or did you mention that they were breastfeeding or bottle feeding? Bottle. Bottle. Okay. So we ask which formula they're on, number one. Number two, um, a lot of times I like to bring the baby in just to observe the baby, just to see how the baby is um, in the office. Sometimes I'll have the mom feed the baby just to see how the mom is feeding, the positioning of the bottle, different things, what bottle the, the mother's using, if she's getting a lot of air into the, um, the way that the mom is feeding could be a huge thing. Um, how she's constituting the formula. Is she using powder? Is she using liquid? Different things like that. And, and how is she making it? Is she shaking the bottle and making tons of, I see moms like this and there's tons of bu bu bubbles in the bottle. And then she's giving the baby and the baby go, 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 and, and there's like bubbles in the, uh, in the bottle and the baby's sucking it down. And then the baby spits up right after the feed, you know, all this gas. So there are different reasons why babies can be fussy and, and colicky and gassy. Um, number one, baby can be, have a little bit of sensitivity to the formula itself, whether it's a milk product, a soy product, um, it all depends which one they're using. Another thing that I like to check as well is sometimes I ask the mom to bring in a couple of different um, poopy diapers. And so I can test the stool for blood in um, the poopy diapers to see if the baby maybe has a little bit of an allergy to the protein and is sensitive to that protein in that formula. So we can do that with just a simple test. It's called a guaiac test. And I ask these moms um, to bring that in. If I do see that it's negative and it's not um, an allergy or a sensitivity, then we go over different reasons, reflux. What's causing the reflux? You know, babies have an immature um, gastrointestinal tract. So I would say that most babies do spit up a little bit. It's not abnormal. Um, if this is a happy baby, that's a happy spitter upper, I'm like, that's okay. If the baby's gaining, the baby's happy, I'm okay with them. And I give them anticipatory guidance on what to do for that reflux. Um, but if that baby's suffering and that baby's spitting up, that baby's colicky, the baby's gassy, I, I show first, sometimes moms don't even know how to burp the baby. So we talk about different positionings. I explain to moms tons of different positions. I'll actually take the baby and, and show her. She's like, oh, I've never even thought to burp the baby that way. You know, just some guidance in itself makes a huge difference. And I love to bring that baby in because being there one-on-one, -on -one, being able to see how that baby is interacting. Is that baby really colicky? You know, um, is the baby crying all day long? Is the baby crying just after feeds? Is it in between feeds? Um, so we get, kind of get a whole story on what's going on with the baby. Um, a lot of times, um, sometimes we need to change the formula. If the baby has a sensitivity, we will try something such as a gentle ease or something that's, you know, that would be the next step sometimes I do with the babies. Um, I did do different things about keeping that baby in the upright position at least a half an hour after each feed. In addition to um, when um, the baby, making sure that we're burping the baby every ounce to two ounces, burping the baby really well. And the other thing is I teach moms also sometimes to space out the feeds. Cause if she's giving the baby back to back, just when the baby's colicky, that baby is not digesting that food. So that stomach lining is being stretched and that's causing pain for that baby. So you're feeding the baby and constantly stretching that stomach wall, causing the baby to have more pain. So sometimes we need a break between feeds and it takes a little bit to get through that couple of first days, but it's once we space out those feeds and that belly can rest a little bit, a lot of times that sometimes resolves some of the spit up, some of the reflux and some of the, the, um, the baby um, grunting. Another thing I tell parents, um, which helps a lot, we have something um, called a windy that parents absolutely love. Um, it's just a small little thing that we put per rectum that helps get the gas out for these babies. I also teach the moms about bicycling the legs and doing different positionings because babies can't tell you where their gas is. They can't tell you if, the, 
Like when we have a gas bubble, we'll move our body. We're moving around all the time. Babies are just laying there. They can't explain to you what they're feeling, how they're feeling, where it's located. They can't ex express their feelings. So I suggest number one, position. Number two, bicycling, spacing out the feeds, upright position. And I like to, at eight weeks of age, I like to space out my feeds. I, I give, give mom schedules sometimes, which really helps them. And if I need to change the formula or check for a, a protein sensitivity with the diapers, or sometimes we even need to start medication for reflux. Sometimes we need to do that as well. But we try everything else before we start meds, all different ways to help this baby without having to do meds. And if, if after we've, we've, um, we've gone through a couple of different things and nothing helps, sometimes we do start meds. But it's a decision that we make together as a parent and as a pediatrician with guidance and support always. Thank you. Um, that was a really complete answer. And it shows how with babies, even really the simplest questions require a lot of conversation and input and why it is so important um, to find that pediatrician that's willing to take the time with you that um, makes you feel comfortable that you can ask all the questions you know that you want um, and why sometimes we will ask you to make a telemedicine or bring the baby in because what you think is a quick you know question on the phone really you know can be a lot more involved so this was great. We've gone a little bit over time, so I, I do want to respect everybody's time. Um, thank you to our panelists. We will send out a copy of this um, webinar for everybody who's registered, whether you've been um, listening throughout the whole time or not. If you have more questions, um, send them to our new parent hotline. And that uh, it's a helpline. Uh, and that uh, woman can also help you navigate the different allied offices and which one you might choose um, depending on your location or your need um, for weekends, evenings, things like that. So um, thank you, Dr. Goldstein, Dr. Vargas Chen, Dr. Schwartz Cohen. Um, it's been a pleasure. Good night, everyone. Good night.